is Tim Guilford. I was introduced recently prior to this uh, as a glutathione guru, and I kind of like that appellation. I've been studying glutathione for the last 20 years, and I'm happy to share what I've learned about COVID-19 and the uh, long form of COVID and depletion of glutathione. Most of what I have to say is going to be found at uh, readysorb.com forward slash COVID. Um, if you have more questions, and I welcome your observations and feedback, you can reach me at the email below and or um, the number below. And uh, I'll put this slide back up at the end so you have a chance to copy it if you haven't been able to get it. In talking about glutathione, on the left you see the structure of glutathione, the three amino acids, glycine, cysteine, and glutamine. And the key feature of that is that this configuration has only one enzyme that breaks it down. Uh, the, the value of glutathione is in the release from this sulfur molecule in the middle of the uh, molecule that releases the hydrogen and electron that can be given to free radicals. And I'll show you how that works in just a second. So we put the glutathione in a liposome, a little lipid bubble, which facilitates its absorption and makes it much more powerful than plain glutathione. This uh, slide illustrates the enzyme that breaks glutathione down. It's uh, actually produced on the outside of cells and it comes in contact with glutathione circulating in the blood. It breaks it down into three amino acids, which then have to be reconstructed inside the cell using two enzymes. The beauty of the liposome is that it bypasses this glutamyl glutamyl transferase enzyme and goes directly into the cell where the lipid covering is removed and then free glutathione is released. And this has been uh, described in a uh, study that's listed below back in 2010. So here's the two enzymes, glutamyl cysteine ligase and then synthase that are needed to put these three amino acids together. And it the power of glutathione is illustrated by the fact that there are two separate pumps that carry glutathione into the mitochondria. So that's the energy producing uh, portion of our cells and uh, they need glutathione in order to become, to, to prevent damage from uh, free radicals. A free radical is like a water, an HOH with a hydrogen stripped off. The OH leaves a free electron and this is a very hungry molecule they call a free radical, and it'll pull a hydrogen from anything around it. Enzymes, for example, even uh, cell structures can be damaged by this uh, radical. And glutathione can work directly to convert that and neutralize it to harmless water, either by itself directly or through an enzyme, which actually puts glutathione in closer contact to the uh, radical and facilitates the production of harmless water. There is a thermostat in the cell which regulates um, the amount of oxidation. In other words, it's called an, I call it an oxidant stat. And when this uh, particular protein is contacted by oxidation, it releases a protein called NERF2 that travels to the nucleus and, set, and tells the nucleus to begin forming antioxidant response elements, which includes glutathione and the transferase enzymes for detoxification and the peroxidase enzyme, which I just showed you. So it turns out that this NERF2 needs to have a uh, companion in the form of BRCA1, BRCA1, uh, works with NERF2 to stimulate the antioxidant element production and glutathione production. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Here's a picture that we're all familiar with, the COVID uh, virus, SARS-CoV-2, with a spike protein. And here's a blow-up showing the spike protein in the uh, recombinant domain where it will attach uh, to the ACE2 receptor on the human cell. Now, these ACE2 receptor cells are found in the nasopharynx, pharynx, and in the lungs. This is a picture of the inside of the lung an air sac and around it up here you can see the pneumocytes 
And patrolling here is a macrophage cell. And this is an important uh, part of our defense. The immune system was thought to be privileged, meaning it didn't have a lot of inflammation because it was known that people inspire a lot of dust particles, uh, pollen, and even there he is. bacteria. Hi, Blake. In the, uh, How are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? <clears throat> the mitochondria uh, pick those yeah. things up. Not a big fan of inflammation. Yeah. So, um, Blake, how have you been feeling? Uh, I haven't touched you, Blake. Our defense inside the cell. Uh, Bruce, we can all hear you. My stomach has just been hurting a lot. I don't really know why. Uh, so here we have the pneumocyte, the type 2 pneumocyte that has an ACE2 receptor. And uh, it can receive the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And uh, it's important to understand the difference between the type 1 and type 2. Type 2 takes care of the type 1. And the type one is where gas exchange okay. occurs. This is where um, CO2 and gets out bowel habits. and oxygen oh, no. gets back into our body. Okay. Um, I think last time we talked, we, I wanted to see the lab. And early on in COVID, this was uh, poorly understood because people would come in ill, but speaking and in reasonably good shape and then suddenly need uh, oxygen support and perhaps even intubation. And what was happening is that the CO2, which drives our sensation of shortness of breath, could get out, but the oxygen that was needed for our system could not get in. So these people had an extremely low pressure of oxygen. It's now known that COVID-19 uh, COVID depletes glutathione. And uh, there are four studies. It's, it, this was started early in 2020 when a Russian named Polenikov observed that the most likely cause for serious manifestations and death in COVID-19 patients was due to an endogenous deficiency of glutathione. Endogenous refers to the uh, amount of glutathione formed inside the cells. Subsequent studies with more large uh, numbers uh, have corroborated this information. And a second study by Kurikov showed that as glutathione in the reduced form, that's the active form, goes down, D-dimer goes up. D-dimer is an indication of increased thrombin formation and is actually part of the degradation uh, byproduct of degradation of thrombus. But the higher D-dimer, the more thrombus for and clotting formation has occurred. So and glutathione appears to be critically involved in this uh, in the formation or, or will allow clots to form when glutathione is depleted. This is the fourth study by Laga and Amaral at the NIH. So this is an NIH study taken from individuals who presented to Washington, D.C. area hospitals. And it shows the normal level of glutathione in their peripheral blood on a nuclear cell. Also, that's the name of macrophages before they get uh, uh, into tissue. And this uh, slide, uh, graph shows that there's a significant decrease in glutathione inside these cells in people that have acute COVID. And this has statistical significance way out here with uh, many zeros. So that implies that it's uh, definitely a significant difference. Over here on the right, we show the normal controls again, but on the on the right hand side of the slide it is uh, glutathione, which is again depleted by statistical significance um, as long as 50 days, almost two months after the initial uh, acute infection. And they showed this occurred even in mild to moderate infections. This slides represent uh, elevations of IL-6. On the, here the circles represent the control and the squares represent the IL-6 elevations. And again, there's a very high degree of statistical significance showing that this is a significant elevation of IL-6. Over here at 50 days, almost two, day, two months after the infection, IL-6 remains elevated in people that had COVID-19, even with mild to moderate illnesses. And this may explain some of the findings that uh, Dr. Patterson has reported in which he shows that IL-6 is elevated in people with prolonged symptoms of COVID. So there's a paper in addendum explaining 
the mechanism of why IL-6 is important. IL-6 was shown to be elevated in COVID-19 along with a material called transforming growth factor beta. Both of these materials are important because they've been shown to deplete glutathione. And both IL-6 and TGF-beta were shown in clinical studies to predict a more severe progression of COVID-19. So this all fits as these uh, immune hormones, we know as cytokines become elevated, glutathione becomes depleted. And we, I'm going to show you studies that suggest that the depletion of glutathione actually uh, facilitates the upregulation of IL-6 and TGF-beta. So it turns out that glutathione appears to be a key factor in COVID-19. And this explains why the severity of diabetes is triple in uh, individuals with diabetes who contract COVID-19. It's quite interesting. I added this portion recently uh, in a study that came out in uh, Lancet in 2022, just a few months ago, showed that diabetes onset risk is increased post-COVID for up to a year, even after mild to, to a, a moderate um, symptoms. So I think it's important if you don't feel well to get checked uh, post-COVID, if you don't feel well to get checked and make sure you don't have diabetes for a starter. Um, here's the two studies that I mentioned that discuss uh, the mechanism of glutathione depletion in COVID-19. Um, the one that's easiest to find, you can just put the words encyclopedia 6357 into a search engine, and it'll pull up the study. We uh, added this information after the first study was published, and it goes into greater detail, and you can see the conditions that are depleted uh, associated with uh, severe COVID and complications. Now, it turns out that uh, in January of this year, a study has shown that if you elevate glutathione in the cell culture with the, the spike protein and the ACE2 receptor, you can prevent the infection of cells uh, by SARS-CoV-2. So this may explain why a large portion of the population who are generally healthy, for example, people that can exercise, uh, build up glutathione, and they may prevent the infection from occurring or lessen the number of cells that become infected. For people with diabetes who have a depletion of glutathione, it's been shown that diabetics over 6.5, uh, hemoglobin A1C of 6.5% stop making glutathione. And uh, it's been published. And we actually have uh, a study showing that uh, liposomal glutathione can reverse those findings. I'll get to that. Um, so it turns out that the S protein itself appears to inhibit this BRCA1 protein. And, and this is uh, needed to facilitate the production of the antioxidant response elements like glutathione and the whole symphony of enzymes that work with it. So spike protein markedly inhibited BRCA1 and uh, therefore the uh, antioxidant gene expression. And this may explain why the cells that have been carrying S protein uh, have chronic inflammation. As they, uh, as glutathione is depleted, you get these shifts in cytokines and production of IL-6 that have been identified in people with long COVID. When glutathione is decreased, a wide range of problems may occur. This article, number one, was written by a fellow named Ned Balatori, who unfortunately has passed away a number of years ago. But his article from 2009 shows a whole array of problems, uh, including atherosclerosis, diabetes, and that sort of thing. And uh, there is an article from 2007 that was done in mice that shows the importance of glutathione in preventing the progression uh, of atherosclerosis. And these uh, mice designed to get atherosclerosis, liposomal glutathione actually uh, lessened the progression. Here's another study by Hajar et al. in which they showed that a decline in glutathione, which accompanies oxidative stress, results and could predict cognitive decline in healthy aging adults. And this probably explains some of the cognitive difficulty that people observe 
this prolonged COVID, that depletion of glutathione leads to cognitive decline. And uh, a year or so earlier, a study uh, showed that decreased glutathione is associated with the risk of mortality in people with coronary artery disease. And this begins to uh, support the how uh, cardiovascular disease accompanies some of the prolonged COVID situations. Uh, fortunately, on the positive side, we have four clinical studies that document the safety and eff efficacy of ready-sorbed liposomal glutathione in restoring glutathione in adults and children. And these studies were conducted in individuals with conditions with low glutathione, such as HIV, type 2 diabetes, which I mentioned before, the enzyme uh, needed to form glutathione uh, is not uh, present or is no longer formed in people with uh, elevated glucose chronically and diagnosed with diabetes. Um, the mechanism for loss of glutathione in autism is re probably related to genetic uh, defects in these enzyme productions. So the clinical, I want to point out that these clinical studies with liposomal glutathione were preceded by cell studies demonstrating that, that liposomal glutathione will restore the glutathione levels and macrophage immune defense a thousand times more effectively than N-acetylcysteine, known as NAC. These studies showed that NAC required an amount a thousand times larger than ready sorbed liposomal glutathione to achieve the same result. So in summary, as glutathione goes down, the cytokines known as IL-6 and TGF-beta go up. And these two cytokines have actually been shown in studies to prevent the formation of glutathione. And the reverse is shown. When you replete glutathione using ready-sorbed liposomal glutathione, you can reduce the IL-6 and TGF-beta and uh, restore them uh, to normal in both HIV and type 2 diabetes. It remains to be seen if we can do this in people with uh, COVID, although anecdotally, with acute COVID, there have been uh, uh, reported improvement uh, without progression to severe disease. And we have an anecdotal testimony uh, showing the same thing happens in uh, prolonged COVID. And these are the studies that uh, support these observations. They are at that uh, website that I mentioned. So overall, one of the questions that almost always occurs is what dose of ready glutathione glutathione might be useful for people. And my personal rule of thumb is that the more ill you have been, the slower you should go. In other words, start low. Start with a quarter teaspoon and work up uh, once a day and work up to twice a day and then progress up to one and a half teaspoon once or twice a day and on up to one teaspoon twice a day. Now, why does this, why do I say go slow? Doctors uh, that are using alternative approaches for many conditions have observed that if you go, that when glutathione is low, you may have accumulated toxins and that sort of thing from the environment. <coughs> Excuse me. And by going slow, you'll allow your system to detoxify without any of the uh, die-off type reaction that has been described. Rarely, this rarely occurs. And after 20 years of using uh, resort glutathione and the four clinical studies, there's uh, very few problems that have been observed, in no serious incidents. So in regard to COVID-19, you can uh, read the uh, information I review it. At, it's a short review at readysorb.com forward slash COVID. If you want to contact me, I welcome any feedback or any questions. And I really appreciate your attention this afternoon. So let me hear from you, and I wish you the best. I hope the glutathione is useful for you. I want to hear from you, pro or con. So thank you very much.